Hi, and welcome to SIP Essentials. If you're new to SIP and want to get down to the finer detail of what SIP is and what it's all about, then you're in the right place. In lesson one of this five-part video series, we'll begin with some general principles of signaling and media exchange, just to set the scene and put things into context. We'll look at the basics of voice over IP before downloading a couple of SIP user agents and using them to set up our first SIP call together. Much of what we do from there on will be analysing SIP logs and getting to know SIP messages to begin with, the invite, the cancel and the 100 trying. We'll look at the payload of a SIP message and we'll study how media streams are set up based on media options. Throughout the lesson we'll get to know a selection of headers you expect to find in SIP messages and we'll also address the issue of reliable delivery. I reckon it should take us about an hour or so to cover these topics. The funny thing is, even with an hour, we'll only get through analysing about half of our first SIP call. There's so much to talk about that analysing the whole call will take us through to the second lesson as well. After that, in the following lessons, we'll be making some more SIP calls, looking more into requests, responses and message headers. We'll look at SIP servers and services available through SIP. And in the final lesson, we'll discuss how and why SIP has become so prominent in communications, due in large to the open, flexible and extensible nature of the protocol. OK then, SIP, the Session Initiation Protocol, the protocol that defines how to initiate or begin a session. But what session? What kind of session is it that SIP initiates? Well, it's all about communications. SIP defines a mechanism or a set of processes through which communication sessions can be established. Now just think about a general communication for a moment. Imagine striking up a conversation with the guy at the next desk. Even though it's subconscious, there are a few things we naturally do to get the conversation going. To begin with, we attract the attention of the other guy. We invite him to chat, probably with a combination of hand gestures, facial expressions and sounds. Thinking about it, the choice of sounds we make or the words we use also lets the other guy know the language we intend to use for our communication. Now you could label this interaction as signaling. One guy signals to the other, gets his attention and invites him to talk and lets him know which language he'd like to use. The other guy then signals back, agreeing to the conversation and confirming that he can communicate with the preferred language. With the signalling complete, both parties have each other's attention and can begin to exchange ideas. Ideas that are exchanged through some kind of media. In the case of this voice conversation, the media exchange is in words in the form of sound waves travelling through the air. So whether we're having a chat with the guy at the next desk or wanting to communicate with someone on the other side of the world, perhaps even using technology and an IP network, the principles are the same. We need to signal to the other party to achieve three things. One, to alert them or get their attention. Two, to invite them to communicate. And three, to make sure we have a common language that we can use for the exchange of these ideas. This done, both parties are ready to exchange their ideas. Both parties are ready to communicate. Let's think about the media exchange when a communication takes place using an IP network. Let's think for a moment about the general principles of voice over IP. Here's two different guys. This time they're in separate locations and are using computer technology and an IP network to help them with their communication. Their words to each other are converted and carried across the IP network in IP packets. At the other side, the voice data is extracted from the packets and converted back into the regular sound waves that we humans can understand. Now looking at that a bit deeper, the sound waves that come from our mouths are converted from analog waves to digital waves. And these digital waves in turn are represented by sequences of binary digits. Collections of these binary digits representing given sounds are then put into IP packets and sent out across the IP network. Now this process happens real time as we're speaking. Analog sound waves coming from our mouths are converted into digital waves which in turn are represented in binary digits that are packetized and sent out across the network. So at the other side the reverse process takes place, the packets are received, the data are unpacked and the media converted back into analog sound waves that we can understand. So this voice over IP is all very well in principle, the idea of exchanging media packets that represents our speech. But in practice, surely there must be more to voice over IP than simply encoding and exchanging media. 
I mean, think about it for a moment. What's missing here in this slide? What should be represented in this space? Well, it's the conversion process or the encoding process. Now, unlike the old world of traditional telecoms where encoding always uses the G711 codec, in the IP world with intelligent endpoints, there's a whole range of codecs to choose from, each with different characteristics and capabilities. So with such a choice available, how do we choose? And how can we be sure that both parties actually have the same codecs or capabilities? And how do those parties know which of those codecs to use for this session? Another thing, think for a moment about IP packets. How are IP packets addressed so they can be sent out to a specific location? Of course, they're addressed with IP addresses. Well, which IP address? How does the caller know the IP address of the callee in order to send those outgoing packets to the correct address? What we need here is a set of descriptions and definitions that lay out a standard process through which any interested party can address these issues and set up a voice over IP communication session. What we need is a protocol. In fact, if you cast your mind back a couple of slides, that's exactly what SIP is all about. It's a protocol that describes and defines processes through which an IP-based communication can be established. In other words, a process by which caller and callee can exchange codec choices or media options, and through which the caller and callee can find or locate each other's IP address in order to exchange those media packets. Right, enough theory, and now time for some practical. Any moment now, I'm going to suggest you download and install a couple of SIP user agents so you can find out for yourself how SIP does just what we've been talking about, initiate communication through signaling. But first, let's talk about user agents. User agents are SIP endpoints, and they come in all shapes and sizes, hard phones, soft phones that run on a PC, and handhelds. Now, they're the equivalent of the regular telephone in that it's the device we use to set up our communications. We even get SIP user agents built into devices you wouldn't normally associate with your communications, like TV set-top boxes and gaming machines. You see, SIP communications are not just for human voice conversations. SIP is happy to set up any communication for anything, for any purpose. Now, there are two big differences, however, between SIP user agents and regular telephones. The first is intelligence. Whilst regular phones are essentially dumb terminals, SIP user agents, on the other hand, have processing capabilities which enable them to make decisions and perform tasks on behalf of the user. We'll look at that topic much more in depth later. The second is the nature of the interaction with other endpoints. In traditional telecoms, it was the switch in the local exchange or the central office that was vital to the call. It switched or connected the phones together. Not so with SIP. SIP can work just fine without any service between them. You see, SIP at its heart sets up a peer-to-peer -peer interaction. Now, a user agent operates in one of two modes, a user agent client, or UAC, or a user agent server, or UAS. The thing is, though, a user agent will switch between these two modes depending on what's happening. The rule to remember is a user agent will act as a user agent client when it wants to start or begin some process. It might be initiating a new call, but it also might be changing the nature of an existing call. It might midway through the call, for example, wish to change from audio only to audio and video. It may even want to start the process of ending an existing call. Now, a symptom of a user agent acting as a user agent client is that it sends out a SIP request. The receiving user agent on the other side is by default now acting as a user agent server or UAS. Now, I always consider SIP to be a very polite protocol, one that can't bear the thought of being rude and keeping someone else waiting or uninformed. So, after receiving a request, a user agent server should always respond immediately with some kind of SIP response. If for no other reason, just to let the user agent client on the other side know that its request has been received. Remember, user agents switch modes depending on what they're doing. It may well be that moments after receiving and responding to a request, 
in other words, acting as a user agent server, a user agent may have some reason to initiate some changes of its own, meaning now that it will switch from acting as a user agent server to acting as a user agent client. Just like before, the symptom of a user agent client is the sending of a SIP request. All of a sudden, what was a moment ago a user agent client is now acting as a user agent server as it responds to the request by sending a SIP response. A key point here is that user agents switch between these two modes depending on what's happening. Please don't think that the user agent that begins the call is always the user agent client and that the called party is always the user agent server. Not so. Whilst on the subject of words and definitions, here's four more terms that you'd be as well to know about. Whenever a user agent initiates a new call, it's known from that point on throughout the whole call as the caller. On the other side, the guy invited to the call is known throughout the whole call as the callee. Any message sent from the caller to the callee is said to be flowing downstream. And any message flowing from the callee to the caller is of course said to be flowing upstream. Now just to be clear, there is no connection between a user agent being the upstream caller and being a user agent client. Although the caller acts as a user agent client when sending a downstream request, it still remains the upstream caller when acting as a user agent server after receiving a request and responding downstream. Likewise, the callee is always the callee downstream, both when acting as a user agent server, sending responses upstream, or as a user agent client, sending requests upstream. We've covered quite a few new terms already. It might be worth pausing for a moment and going over them in your own mind, just to make sure you're happy with what they all mean. So when you're ready, press play under the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, and my definitions will appear and you can see if we're in agreement. Right, it's about time you got your hands on some real SIP. In theory, it doesn't matter which SIP user agent you use, as the outcome should all be the same. But can I suggest, though, that for this session at least, you click on the link here to download the installer for the same user agent that I'm going to use. And I'll show you how to set things up, and then I'll ask you to use it to set up calls and analyze what's going on. Remember, of course, to make a mental note of where on your local computer you've saved the installer. So I've downloaded the installer into a folder called User Agents here on my C drive. I'm just going to extract that now. Once extracted, can I suggest to you that you just slightly rename the user agent folder and call it something like user agent one, because I'd like us to have two user agents that we can use to set up calls together. So can you extract the file a second time and this time rename the folder to user agent two? Now there's nothing to stop you running the user agent from one executable, but I suggest we have two folders, one for each one, because this user agent stores its settings, and that way we can make sure that each user agent keeps its own configuration, its own settings. If you open up one of those user agent folders, you'll see that there is an executable through which we can start this user agent. This one runs on Java 1.5, so you'll need to have a version of Java running on your machine. Before starting up and configuring this user agent, you first need to know that it likes to run on a machine with only one network adapter. Can I suggest you open a command prompt and type in ipconfig? And the system will then show you an entry for each of your network adapters you have on your machines. Now mine is showing just one, and that's the way this user agent likes it. So if you see multiple entries here, including any VPN IP addresses, then there's a good chance the user agent will bind to the wrong one and unexpected things might happen. So my tip here is that just for now, you disable, not just disconnect, but disable all the network adapters except for the one you want to use. And then by all means, re-enable them when you're done. So let's go ahead now and start up that user agent. I'll double click on the executable there. And the user agent should appear any moment now. Okay, there it is. Right, go straight to the configuration tab, if you will, and let's take a look at the configuration options for this user agent. We have three ports here that are set to listen for incoming SIP signaling packets using different transport protocols. You'll see here at the top we have port 5060, which is the standard default SIP port. Using the standard port for 5060 is fine when you've got one user agent running one machine. 
Now, because we're going to have two user agents running on our machines today, two user agents through which we'll set up calls to each other, they can't obviously both listen on the same default port. So I'm going to suggest that for now we change this port from the default 5060 to something like 3001, and on the next user agent we'll change it to 3002. Looking down in the configuration, we see that the user agent has already picked up automatically your IP address, so that's great, we'll leave that at that. The auto contact checkbox here is a checkbox through which we can say to the user agent, can you please automatically generate a SIP contact address for me? Now notice that this SIP contact address that it already has there ends with port 5060. That's the one that we've changed a moment ago. So leaving that auto contact there if we like, if we click apply, we'll notice that it's changed the contact address for us to port 3001. Now we're going to talk about the contact address in much more detail later during this session. Notice also that we have a from SIP address, again another address we'll talk about in more detail. Um, if you like you can leave it as it is, or if you want to you've got the choice of putting an optional username in there. I'm going to put an optional username in there, why not? Okay then let's click on apply and click on sessions and we're ready to go with this one. Okay so I'm going to load up my second user agent now. I'm going to go to the second user agent folder and double click on the executable just like before. And as the user agent comes up, it's flashing the configuration tab telling me that there's something I need to be aware of. And that's namely that one of the ports is, has been used elsewhere, actually, in the other user agent. So it's changed it for me. But the key thing that I'm interested in here is changing from the default port 5060 to port 3002. So I've got my two SIP user agents now listening for incoming SIP signaling packets on port 3001 and 3002. Now last time I suggested you leave the auto contact box checked. This time, just for a bit of variety, I'm going to suggest that we uncheck the checkbox, meaning that we are now free to choose the contact address for ourselves. And because I'm now taking responsibility for my own contact address, I've got to make sure that it's right. So I'm going to put in here manually 3002. The from address, just like before, if we want to, we can put in a username in the from address. This time, just for variety, I'm going to choose to leave it as it is. OK, click on Apply, and we'll go to the Sessions tab, and we should have two user agents that uh, are ready to go to make a call between them. So I'm going to type in here the address of the guy I want to call, SIP, and actually it has to be exactly the same as the address we see here in the contact address. In fact, I'm just going to copy it, why not? Save me some typing here. So with the address of the other guy typed into my to field, I can click on dial, and straight away we see that there's been a communication between these two user agents. The downstream user agent is alerting. I can click on accept and take the call. So the call is now connected. The connection is made between the upstream and the downstream user agent. OK, so there's RTP packets now flowing nicely between these two user agents. Um, the user agents, whenever they like, can hang up by clicking any of these buttons. I'm going to hang up here from the caller and bring the call to an end. OK, so there we have our first SIP call. So with your two user agents installed and configured, your task now is to make a call. As you do so, remember what's happening. You're setting up a call between two parties. The user agent is just the tool through which one party signals or attracts the attention of the other. And as the invited party takes the call, it's his user agent that signals back his acceptance. The exchange of media packets then begin, analog speech from the computer's microphone or handset taken by the user agent, sampled and converted to digital format and packaged in media packets to be sent out over the network to the other party. The downstream user agent in turn unpacks those packets and converts the digital data back into analog, playing the audio through the computer speaker. Cool. So, Go ahead and enter the address of the callee in the to field. For now, it must be exactly the same as the address we configured a moment ago in the downstream user agent configuration tabs, contact address, and then click dial. If the address is correct and you've configured things properly, the downstream user agent should try to then alert the user. So click on accept on the downstream user agent then to take the call. From that point on, at any time, you can click on hang up on either user agent to terminate the call. Let's take a moment to go through some questions now and see how much of this is making sense. Now that you've made your first SIP call, it's time to go under the bonnet and investigate what's going on behind the scenes. 
One of the things I really like about this particular user agent is the way it lets us view the SIP messages that are sent and received in each call. Up here on this user agent is a View Call Logs tab, and if you click it, you'll see all the SIP messages from this upstream user agent's perspective. Take the other user agent, click on the same View Call Logs tab, and you'll see the SIP messages exchanged from this guy's perspective. So you'll be using these logs quite a lot in our analysis. Can I just ask you in preparation for the next workshop to go down to the Clean button and clean up both of your user agents ready for the next task. So with the log screens open on both user agents, I'd like you to make another call. This time, however, keep an eye on what's happening real time regarding dispatch and receipt of SIP messages between the user agents. I'm hoping you'll be looking for and asking things like, what are the messages? When were they sent? And what could they be for? In fact, I'd like you to grab a piece of paper if you don't mind and sketch a line down each side, labeling the lines as caller and callee. Then, as you set up the call, or perhaps a number of calls if you want, draw arrows between the caller and callee that represent the messages exchanged, labeling each with a suitable name. There should be seven messages to map by the time the call is set up and torn down. Now, some of the messages will be requests and some will be responses. As you go through the task, try to find a rule for yourself that we can apply to determine which is which. I'd really like to recommend to you that you familiarize yourself with this basic SIP call flow, even to the extent where you learn this exchange off by heart. To me, it's foundation stuff that all SIP folks need to know. Now, one more thing before you get started. SIP defines six types of requests and six types or families of response. Can you take another scrap piece of paper and as you encounter these requests and responses during these lessons, jot them down and make a list. Periodically, I'll ask you to reference your list in our quest to learn more about the protocol. Great, I'm assuming now that you've successfully set up the call and that your call flow map is complete with seven arrows, each named with a label or note that defines its purpose. You should also have at least a couple of items on your list of six requests and six response types. What I'd like to do now is set up the call myself with the idea that we can discuss a few things as we go along, hopefully getting a good idea of what's happening and perhaps more importantly, why they happen. You can check the call flow map I'll be putting together with the one that you've made just now. I'm gonna play with time a little bit, slowing it up periodically to give us a moment to look at things and digest them as they happen. I'm also going to be asking you lots of questions which I hope will guide you to discover things rather than you having to listen to me rambling on. So here we go. Okay, I'm going to make the call again, but this time I'm going to click on the call logs tabs for both the user agents. So here we go, I'll click dial. And as I do that, it's almost as if the user agent says, right, the user has clicked dial, so I'll construct and send an invite request on his behalf addressed to the callee address. Now, this is a good point to formally introduce the concept of SIP requests. Now, SIP requests are created and sent between SIP devices to start some kind of interaction or to issue an instruction to do something, perhaps to initiate a new call, just like we've seen with this invite request. Requests are also used to change the nature of an existing call and even to begin the process of ending a call. Each of the standard tasks performed by SIP has its own request. There's just six of them, some of which you'll have on your list already. There are also other non-standard tasks that SIP facilitates, such things as text messaging, event notifications and referrals, each with their own set of additional SIP requests, requests defined not in the standard RFC, but in SIP extensions. We'll get on to talking about SIP extensions later. Now, one of the reasons why SIP is said to be so simple is that it's plain text. A few pointers in the right direction and most of us will be able to read the content of the SIP message and have a fairly good idea what will happen when the request is sent downstream to the next SIP device. So looking at the structure of the request now, there are essentially three parts to any SIP request. At the top of the request we have the start line, followed in the middle by a selection of SIP headers that contain useful information needed to process the request downstream, followed after an empty line by the message body, often called a payload. Let's take some time now to look at these three areas in more detail. Of course, it's the to and the from headers. Not exactly rocket science, those ones. Although the purposes of these headers are obvious, it's important to know that the addresses in the to and the from headers are only ever used to identify the original intended recipient of the request, 
and the sender of the request. They are never ever used for routing purposes. Now take a closer look at these two headers though. Besides the fact they contain different addresses, what other difference is there between them? The from header has a parameter added to the end. Now parameters are simply an additional way of adding information to a header. In this case, it's a standard tag parameter used for identifying endpoint to endpoint relationships. Now keep an eye on things and you'll see another tag parameter appear later in this call setup. Okay, moving on, think back a moment to when you were playing with a call setup a moment ago. There's a good chance you might have used the downstream user agent to end the call, meaning that the downstream callee user agent had an address with which to route the subsequent request back upstream to the caller. The question is, how does it get such an address? Where does it get it from? The answer is, of course, it's supplied by the caller user agent in one of those headers in the initial request. The question now is, which one? Logically, it could be one of only two. Okay, so you've hopefully deduced now that the address supplied by the upstream user agent must be its own address. And there are only two headers that contain the upstream user agent's address, the contact header and the via header. Applying a bit more logic and you've hopefully realized that it's in the contact header that the upstream user agent puts its own address giving it to the downstream user agent so that he can use it to route any subsequent request during this call. Regarding the address in the contact header, I like to think of my user agent saying to the other guy, oh, by the way, here is where I am right now, just in case you want to send me any requests during this call. This is where I am contactable. Now, I've often found that to begin with, the contact header and the from header can be confused. So here's a golden rule I'd like to stress. The from address states kind of who I am, whereas the contact address effectively states where I am, where I'm contactable. Okay, the next focus of our analysis will be in the message payload. But first, it's probably an idea to pause and ponder over some new terms just to make sure you're happy with what they all mean. And how about these? We've looked at the start line and at some of the message headers. Let's look for a moment at the message body or the payload. Now, SIP doesn't actually care what goes in the payload. It's just a space in which one user agent can send content that's not SIP to another. It could be some plain text. It could be a link to another resource, maybe a web service. Or it could be the data of a bitmap image used to transfer a photograph. Usually though, particularly with invite requests, the payload is populated with information that helps the user agents set up the exchange of media packets or the media stream. This media stream data has come to be known as media options. So let's spend a few moments now on the subject of media options. So here's the caller with his invite and in the payload of his request are his media options formed according to the rules and regulations of the session description protocol or SDP, a separate protocol for defining and conveying all the information needed to exchange media packets. Now my eye always seems to be drawn down here to the bottom part of the media options to the M equals something header. Now M stands for media and it's here the user agent declares not necessarily what media it supports, but more specifically, what media it's willing to use for this communication. In this case, I see straight away that it's only willing to use audio for this call. And that's probably because this user agent can only do audio. See how there's only one M header, and it clearly states audio. Now we might sometimes also see an additional M header, like M equals video, signifying the user agent also has video capabilities and would like to use it. Having established the media type it would like to use, the media options also provide the addresses and the port information the other guy needs to know so that he can route those media packets should he be willing to accept the invitation. Finally, I tend to look at the digits at the end of the media headers. Now these digits represent the codecs the user agent is willing to use in encoding the media before sending it out across the network. In this case, the user agent has two codecs it's willing to use, 8 representing the G711 ALOR codec and 0 representing the G711 MULOR codec. Now, in everyday language, I read this description as saying something like, should you accept this invitation, 
please send your media packets to this IP address where I'll be listening on this port. Or in other words, this is where you'll send your media packets to me. And I'm also happy to use either of these two codecs, although I do have a preference. More on this later. The caller user agent puts the plain text of his invite request, including his media options, into an IP packet and sends it out over the IP network to the downstream user agent. Now, one more thing before we move on from the outgoing invite. Bearing in mind the payload is not limited to just describing media options but can be used for other things too, and bearing in mind all these different payloads have different characteristics, some clues have to be given to the downstream user agent so that it can read the content in the right context. In other words, the user agent needs to know which parser to use and how many characters it should read in in order to get the whole content. Nothing more, nothing less. So here's another task for you. Switch back to your user agent and look at the invite for two SIP headers that you think give clues to the downstream user agent regarding how to read the payload in the correct context. Hopefully you'll have concluded that a user agent uses the content length and the content type headers to show the user agent on the other side how to read or pass the payload in the correct context. Remember, the content type header lets the other user agent know what parser to use to read the payload, and the content length tells the other user agent how many characters to read, making sure it reads just the right amount, no more, no less. Gosh, we've been at it for some time now and have only just managed to make and send the first request. Hopefully though, you're starting to get a good idea already of how SIP works and what's found in a SIP message and why they need to be there. Let's continue with our call flow and investigate what happens next. So having included his media options and clues in the SIP headers about how to process the message, as we've said, the user agent puts the plain text of the invite and sends it in an IP packet out over the network. In this case, it's directly to the called party's SIP address, peer-to-peer -peer signaling. The downstream user agent receives the request, reads or passes it, and on seeing the request type being invite, knows immediately that someone's inviting his user to a voice call. Notice how the request is received in exactly the same form as it was sent out. The same request URI, same set of headers, and same payload. A key point here is that the downstream user agent now has the media options of the caller, so it knows what codecs the other guy is willing to use and, and where to send the media packets. So in summary of this first step, the caller sends out an invite request to the callee, inviting him to talk and providing his media options. Being a very polite protocol, SIP defines that the receiving user agent should straight away respond back to the caller, in the first instance simply to confirm that the request has arrived. So this seems a good place to formally introduce SIP responses. SIP has six families or types of response, each identified by a three-digit number, beginning with digits 1 to 6, 100s, 200s, 400s, and so on, each type reporting some different context back to the calling party. The structure of the response is similar to the request in that it has a start line at the top with a status code and a reason phrase, followed by a selection of headers. Now, although this one doesn't have one, doesn't need one, some responses will also have a message body, through which, just like the request, additional content or payload can be sent between the SIP devices. Now, before we look together at this 100 trying response, can you take a moment to look at your 100 trying in your own user agent log and compare it with your invite request that preceded it? Use the prompt on the next screen to jot down some of your observations. I'm hoping that you'll note at least three things, three noteworthy things when you compare those two messages. In fact, I'm also hoping that as you study, you'll find yourself asking one or two questions as well. So make a note of those two, and we'll discuss them in a moment. Interesting. Now what jumps out at me when I look at these messages side by side is that almost all the headers have simply been copied from the request straight into the response, almost it seems without any thought. The one that's different is the content length, which is now zero. Why should the content length in the response be zero? Well, of course, it's because there is no payload in the response. This is just SIP's way of saying that there isn't any payload. Besides the content length, the significant difference I hope you spotted between the two messages are the start lines. In fact, it was when comparing the start lines as a newcomer to SIP that I had one of those questions I'm hoping you might have asked yourself in your analysis just now. 
For me, having worked with SIP for a while, when I look at these two start lines, there are two things conceptually I see common to both, and one thing conceptually that's missing from the response. Can you take a moment and compare for yourself to see if you can find those two things that are common to both and the one thing that conceptually is missing from the response? Here are the three things that I'm thinking about. The bit that defines the purpose of the message, the bit that provides the routing information for the message, and the bit that provides the protocol version. So with the request, it's the method type which defines its purpose. The request URI for the routing, and the bid on the end for the protocol version. In the response, however, although in a different order, we now have at the beginning the bit for the protocol version. And for the purpose, we actually have two things, the status code and the reason phrase, meaning that there is no routing information in the response start line, nothing in the start line to determine the route for the response to go back from the user agent server up to the user agent client. So that now begs the question, how is the response routed? Any ideas? Well, why not take a look at the response and come up with a hypothesis about how you think the user agent server gets routing information to route the response back upstream? Simple. It's the VIA header. The user agent client puts its own IP address in the VIA header of its outgoing request especially for the purpose of telling the guys downstream where the response should be sent. The downstream user agent, in copying the VIA header address into its response, remembers to use that address in the routing of the response. So unlike the request, where the routing information is typically held in the request URI in the start line, the routing of the responses are different. It's the VIA header that provides the routing information for the response. I've got to be straight with you. When I found out it was the VIA header that determined the route back for the response and not the start line, I had to wonder why. Well, there's a good reason why, one that we'll deal with later in Lesson 3. But as we cover more concepts, I wonder if you can figure out why for yourself before we get there. Another thing I remember questioning when learning about SIP responses was something to do with the to and the from headers. Something puzzled me. Take a quick look again now at your 100 trying and compare the to and the from headers with those in the invite. Are things as you expect them to be? I personally was quite surprised to see the to and the from headers had not been reversed. I was kind of expecting that the to address in the response would show who the response was going to and likewise the from address would signify who the response was from. Not so. The to header does not mean this is a response to SIP John. The to and the from headers are simply copied from the request straight into the response. They're not changed at all. I always suggest in reading SIP responses that we put things in the context of it being a response to a request. Accordingly, I recommend we read the to and the from headers in the response something like this is a response to a request that was to John from Dave. Now that we know how the response is routed from user agent server back to user agent client, my next question is, why? What's the purpose of the 100 trying? Well, here's a question for you, one to set the context for this next discussion. Which of the transport layer protocols do you think SIP uses for carrying its signaling requests, those all important requests without which the call cannot set up successfully? One could be forgiven for thinking that SIP's default transport protocol would be TCP. After all, one of TCP's qualities is that it takes care of reliable delivery. We just give it some data and an address, and it takes care of the rest. If some of the packets get lost on the way, we don't have to worry about it as TCP checks what was sent and what arrived and automatically takes care of retransmissions if something goes wrong. Funnily enough, TCP is not SIP's standard transport protocol. Whilst it's fantastic at taking care of reliable delivery, it just takes too long to set up the connection and to check that all is well with every transfer. SIP prefers instead to use a transport protocol that has much less overhead, one that is much quicker. The default transport for SIP is UDP, 
Now UDP receives data from the upper layers, just like TCP, but sends it out over the network without spending any time checking to see if the guy on the other side even exists, never mind whether or not he's ready to receive. Now this means that it's very quick. However, UDP is a connectionless transport protocol. There are no checks made before or after transmission. If the packet gets lost on its way over, what does UDP do about it? Nothing. UDP doesn't even know or care about the loss. Its job is to send and forget as quickly as possible and not worry about anything else. UDP will not transmit and the packet is lost. So you might be asking, well, what happens to a SIP request then if it's UDP that delivers the packet and the packet gets lost? Well, the answer is that SIP has its own built-in mechanism for reliable delivery of its signaling messages. In fact, it's the user agents themselves that are responsible between them for reliable delivery. Here's how it works. When a user agent sends out a request, it sets a timer for half a second and waits to see if it gets anything back. If the message gets lost on the way, or if there's no SIP device on the other side to receive the request, and nothing comes back before the timer expires, the user agent will assume something has gone wrong and will retransmit the request. At the same time, it will set the timer, this time for one second, and wait to see if anything comes back from this one. When the user agent on the other side receives the request, being the user agent of a polite protocol like SIP, it knows immediately to create and send some kind of response. Initially, just for purposes of letting the guy upstream know that his request has been received and not to retransmit anymore. In fact, that's what the 100 trying is for. It says, I have received your request and I'm now trying to do something about it. You don't need to retransmit it anymore. I have it. The trouble is, <laughs> this is UDP and UDP is not having a good day today. The response perhaps on its way upstream may also get lost. What do you suggest happens now if the response does get lost? If something happens so the response doesn't make it back to the user agent client, then the timer will expire again. Remember how the user agent reset the timer after the first transmission failed? It'll then do exactly the same thing it did last time the timer expired without receiving a response. Retransmit the request and reset the timer, this time for two seconds. The user agent on the other side then receives the request and on realising it's a retransmission, simply retransmits the response. If the response arrives upstream OK, then the user agent client heaves a big sigh of relief and says, Phew, I'm happy now. I know that my request has been delivered reliably. I don't need to retransmit anymore. It's time for you to do some analysis again now, this time on the subject of reliable delivery and retransmissions. I'd like you to figure out a way of organising things at your user agent so that when you set up another call, it will retransmit the request a number of times. Why not do that now, then press play when you've done it. If you need a clue about how to set things up for retransmissions, press play and I'll give you a tip. If you need a clue, consider the dial-out address that you choose to use in your user agent. So, you've hopefully already done something like enter a bogus address in the dial-out field of your user agent with no SIP device at that address. So, of course, when the request goes out, nothing comes back and your user agent retransmits. So, here's how I'd do it. I'll just rearrange the user agents a little bit here, give myself a bit more space. And I'll open up the call tabs so we can see what's going on there. Okay, so I'll just bring up the same address I used last time and click dial. And we can see straight away the call's being set up. I'll accept and hang up. So I'll clean up. And all I need to do now is change one of these digits here in the address to make an address that does not exist. Let's say we're going to dial out to SIP 192.168.2.2.11 rather than 2.10. Here we go, dial. Now, of course, there's no user agents on the other side, nothing to receive the request, and therefore nothing to send back a response. And we're getting retransmissions. Next, take a look at just the initial invite request, not the retransmissions just yet. And look for the header or headers you think might change to signify a retransmission. Once you've come up with your hypothesis, then take a look at the retransmitted request and check things out. So what differences did you find between the first transmission and the retransmission? There are only a couple of headers we haven't looked at yet together. So uh, how about the CSEC header? Did the CSEC header change at all? No? Ah, oh, well, how about the call ID? Hmm, that didn't change either. Well, you may have realised by now that actually 
there was no change at all in the request between the first transmission and the retransmission. In fact, that's how a user agent knows an incoming request is a retransmission. It's exactly the same as one that it's seen already a moment ago. So, when you're looking through log files in real life situations, perhaps log files with hundreds or even thousands of messages, you know now that when you see multiple repeated messages, it's because something has not responded as expected. Something has not perhaps been delivered reliably and retransmissions have taken place. It will also be good to study the pattern of transmissions. Find out how many transmissions or retransmissions the user agent makes before it finally gives up. And then calculate the time interval between the first transmission and the last retransmission. So hopefully you'll have found out that if nothing comes back, the invite is transmitted a total of seven times over a period of 32 seconds. Each retransmission is given a little bit more time just to help prevent clogging of the network and to provide a bit more time in case more time is needed on the other side. Finally, make a prediction about what you think will happen after the user agent has finally given up on the request. Then take a look at the log and check your hypothesis. Remember though, SIP is a very polite protocol. Now regarding what happens after the user agent gives up retransmitting, Hopefully you've remembered that SIP is a very polite protocol and as such can't bear the thought of some guy downstream not knowing what's going on. I mean, perhaps there is someone downstream and perhaps they have been receiving each of the requests, but for some reason none of their responses have made it back. So just in case, the user agent client creates and sends a cancel request, meaning something like, hey, you know that request I sent you a moment ago? Forget it. Cancel it. I'm not doing anything more with it just now. Now the cancel request is just the same as any other request. It needs to be delivered reliably. So my question to you, what will the user agent do now as it sends out the cancel? What will it expect? After sending a cancel request, the user agent sets a timer again for half a second, hoping to receive something back, some type of response before the timer expires. If it does, it can be happy in the knowledge that its cancel request was delivered reliably and will not need to be retransmitted. It's pretty unlikely, however, that the user agent client will receive a response to a cancel when it didn't receive one to its invite. But that's not the point. SIP is a very polite protocol and it does its best to keep others updated and not hanging around wondering what's going on. I hope you noticed this time, for a non-invite request, there are actually 11 transmissions, not 7, over the same time period of 32 seconds. After this, I think we'd all agree that the user agent has had a jolly good go at being polite and can now legitimately give up, confident that it's done all in its power to make sure that anyone downstream knows this session isn't going anywhere. So what are some real uncontrived reasons that we might see retransmissions in the SIP network? One that I come across time and time again is the issue of firewalls on the machines upon which the user agents are running. Firewalls that don't know about SIP. The user agent client sends out a request and it arrives at the right place but is blocked by this non-SIP aware firewall. So the user agent tries again and again and again, seven times in total over 32 seconds, but always to no avail. Not even the cancel gets through. The solution is to either turn off the firewall or perhaps even better, to configure the firewall to allow SIP traffic to go through. And remember that's by default port 5060, although you may have chosen to use a different port today. Another reason might be something as simple as having made a typo as you enter the dial-out SIP address. Now although we think we have the right address, if it's not absolutely correct, it's as if the downstream user agent just doesn't exist. So when the request gets sent out, it has nowhere to go and of course will not trigger any responses. The solution here is, of course, to check the address we dial. Now, at this point in our lesson, at least, check that what you enter is the same as what's being configured in the downstream user agent's contact address. It won't always be the contact address you'll be dialing, though. Uh, later on in the next lesson, we'll be using different types of addresses for dialing out. One final reason we'll look at could be some incorrect user agent configuration. It could be that we've dialed out to the correct address meaning that the request is sent out and arrives as expected at the other side, but because the user agent hasn't been configured correctly, it may have some incorrect content relating to the routing of the response, or even a subsequent request, back upstream. 
So the downstream user agent correctly takes routing information from the request, but because it's incorrect data, the response will be sent to a non-existent location. And although the response was sent, the user agent client didn't receive it, and the retransmission will be triggered. So if you get problems, remember to check that your user agent is configured properly. OK, I've introduced quite a few more new terms in these last few topics. You know what to do now. Try and verbalize the definition for each one of them. And when you're ready, press play and my definitions will appear. Well, I've been talking for almost an hour already. And with all the practicals and analysis, you've been working for longer than that. How about I summarize now briefly what we've done so far give you an opportunity to work through some review questions and then just before we bring the session to a close I'll tell you what's coming up in the next lesson. So what we've said is the downstream user agent after receiving the invite constructs a 100 trying response copying almost all the headers from the receive requests and sends it to the address in the via header back to the upstream user agent client confirming reliable delivery of the invite request. Now on receiving something back from the other side the upstream user agent client heaves a sigh of relief happy in the assurance that its request was received and that someone is trying to do something about it and that he doesn't need to worry anymore about retransmissions. Now that messages have been exchanged, we can visualize a signaling path between the two endpoints. It's not a private tunnel or anything, it's just a route over which messages can pass between caller and callee. So summarizing the call flow so far, and remember it's this diagram that I'm hoping you'll commit to memory, we see the initial invite request, followed straight away by a 100 trying response. So, we began the lesson with some general principles of signaling and media exchange. Remember the guys at their desks and the need to attract each other's attention and agree to communicate before they can start exchanging media? We looked at general principles of voice over IP and how it describes the process of encoding and sending media packets across the network. But we also discussed, however, that voice over IP alone doesn't provide enough detail regarding how the session should actually be established. In other words, how the two parties find each other's location or IP address and which encoders they should use. Now, This is of course where SIP comes in. It's SIP that defines the processes and behaviours that enable parties to know what to do to set up that voice over IP session. In fact, SIP does more than initiate sessions, but we haven't really touched on any of those yet. We looked at SIP user agents and how they are the devices we use to set up our calls. Remember how they have two modes, switching between user agent client and user agent server, depending on whether they're starting something or responding to something? We then set up our first SIP call together, and you've begun already analyzing the exchange of messages within the call and are in the process of committing the basic call flow to memory. You've started to analyze SIP messages as well, the requests and the responses, and so far we've looked at the invite request used to begin the initiation of a voice call, and we've looked at the 100 trying response used to confirm reliable delivery of the request. We've also taken our first look at the cancel request in the context here of SIP being a very polite protocol wanting to let the other party know when it's given up retransmitting a request after not receiving any response. We've made a start looking at headers within the SIP messages. We know that the to and the from headers always give a constant reference as to who the request is intended for and who the request is from regardless of whether we're reading the to and from headers in the request or the response. Remember how they don't change, they're not reversed in the response. Now I like to think of the from header as saying, this is who I am. The contact header, on the other hand, says something like, this is where I am. SIP uses the contact header to give the sender's address to the other guy so he knows where to route those subsequent requests back upstream. We haven't really done much with the subsequent requests yet, but we'll deal with those in the next lesson. We talked about the content type and the content length headers and how they provide a context for the guy on the other side regarding how to read the payload. In other words, which parser to load up. In an invite request, it's almost always going to need to use the SDP parser. The via header is simply for routing responses back upstream to the caller. Not to be confused with the contact header, even though they both have the addresses of the sender, the via header is for routing responses, the contact header is for routing subsequent requests. We've looked at the payload of our invite and saw how it was used to carry information about the codex a user agent is willing to use, plus routing information. Not for responses or subsequent requests, but this time for routing media packets.
Remember how these media options are defined by a separate protocol? The Session Description Protocol, or the SDP. Finally, we spent quite a long time on the important topic of reliable delivery. We discussed how SIP chooses to use an unreliable transport protocol, UDP, because of its speed in delivery. But we also discussed, however, that because reliable delivery is so important, we can't afford for packets to be lost as they sometimes are with UDP, SIP has its own mechanism for reliable delivery, based on user agents setting timers and retransmitting requests if they don't receive something back before the timer expires. Often that first response coming back will be the 100 trying. We saw how an invite will be retransmitted a total of seven times over 32 seconds before it finally gives up and sends a cancel request. Right, got all that? Let's see how you do now with these review questions. Great. Coming up in the next lesson, we'll finish off this first peer-to-peer -peer call we've been working on together. We'll get more into the SIP messages and the SIP message flow. We've got more work to do on media options and how the callee's media options now must be returned to the caller. And there's that perhaps controversial issue of negotiating media options to deal with. You know when clients have multiple codecs to choose from, which one do they actually use? We'll get into more headers and we'll spend a bit more time on reliable delivery. Next time focusing on reliable delivery of the final responses. Finally in the next lesson we'll look at the fascinating topic of root sets and how user agents keep and use them for routing subsequent requests. Can't wait!